Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to our Partners and Platform webinar today, which is dedicated to the Dimensions Platform UK, an MRC-funded uh, public-private partnership focused on accelerating research into the early detection and treatment of dementia. As you know, translating mechanistic findings into novel therapeutic approaches for dementia is a key objective for the UK DRI. So we consider the Dementia uh, Platform UK as a natural partner for the UK DRI to facilitate this uh, translation step and accelerate progress in tackling dementia. So it is my real pleasure today to introduce a group of guests who will give you an overview of, the, of what DPUK can offer and also how UK DRI researchers could benefit from collaborating with this important uh, resource and organization. So the guests uh, today are uh, Professor John Gallagher, who is a professor of cognitive health at the Oxford University and director of the Dementias Platform UK. Um, Dr. Uh, Vanessa Raymond, who is a senior clinical research director, Oxford Brain Health Clinical Trials Unit. Dr. Sarah Bauermeister, cognitive neuropsychologist in the Department of Psychiatry at Oxford, senior data and science manager at DPUK. Professor James Rowe, Department of Clinical Neurosciences in Cambridge, uh, who is the DPUK Associate Director in the Experimental Medicine Incubator. And Dr. John Isaac, Senior Director of uh, JNJ Neuroscience Innovation, co-lead of the DPUK Synaptic Health Experimental Medicine Team. So I leave uh, time to you and uh, we look forward to your presentations. Thanks everybody for joining us today. Okay. Well, thank you, uh, Giovanna, for that uh, excellent in introduction, and, and thank you most of all for the invitation. It's our great pleasure to, to share with you uh, DPUK and hopefully the opportunity that it provides uh, for the DRI. So I'm going to go straight to my screen share now, which will be easier said than done. Ah, sorry, uh, can I just say something? Uh, I would like to invite uh, all the people who are actually listening to us. Thank you for joining. And you could use your box, uh, the q and a box for your questions. Uh, we can pick them up and then we'll try to address some of your questions after each presentation. And if, of course, also at the end of, uh, of the talk, uh, at, the, at the overall talk, if you want. So please feel free to write down your questions uh, whenever you want, and then we will pick them up. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Giovanna. Now. So let's uh, okay. so uh, if if uh, somebody could just reassure me that you're seeing uh, the screen share of the PowerPoint, yeah, lovely. Okay. And um, so, can you please uh, use the display settings as before because we can. Uh, Okay, there we are. Perfect. We are. Okay, so uh, Dementia's Platform UK uh, has, I think, three main utilities, and they are all uh, directed towards facilitating experimental medicine for dementia. Uh, so we have rapid data access, and uh, Sarah's going to demonstrate our data portal. We have precision recruitment, and uh, Vanessa will uh, speak to that. And we have a mechanism targeted uh, experimental medicine studies, and uh, James Rowe and John Isaac uh, will, will speak to that. Where DPUK stands in the uh, UK dementia research ecosystem is that uh, if you think of DPUK as contributing to the vaguely pink um, uh, parts of the arrow, we have uh, cohort data uh, from a large number of cohorts, which I'll describe shortly which can be uh, in, uh, examined, uh, interrogated for mechanism discovery. We have uh, early clinical testing phase zero to one B, uh, where we can have risk stratified recruitment uh, so that the right person gets uh, recruited to the right study, the right hypothesis at the right stage of their uh, clinical journey. And we also through the cohort data are linking with HDI UK to uh, outcomes to routinely collected outcomes, uh, uh, GP data, hospital data, so that we can go really from the uh, very first signs of dementia uh, through to uh, being confident about uh, measuring the outcomes for the final, uh, the final clinical uh, condition. Where we think we can help with uh, the DRI is that uh, you, of course, are experts in uh, basic me mechanism discovery. And what we would like to do um, 
Robin's Deep UK comprises three main elements. We have a knowledge environment, the data portal, which again Sarah will uh, demonstrate. Uh, we have the child delivery framework, which comprises recruitment registers and a framework for looking at uh, for uh, doing studies more efficiently and uh, multi-centre studies uh, uh, with greater precision. Uh, and Vanessa will, will address that. But they're all moving towards uh, facilitating the experimental medicine incubator. Uh, James and John will, will talk to that. And the experimental medicine incubator, uh, which we're very pleased with actually, one of its unique uh, aspects is the model, the pre-competitive public-private partnership model that, that we employ. Um, we have three networks. We have an imaging network. You can see the centers there across the country, uh, a stem cell network, an informatics network. And these networks are placed in centers of excellence. Again, the, the basic locating is partly due to the competence of the, the scientists there, partly due to our desire to be able to facilitate multi-center studies uh, around the UK. The, the data portal is a uh, trusted third-party data processor. It provides a single point of contact, enabling us to standardize data, and it provides a flexible and scalable workspace for analytics. Effectively, you can have your own private statistical laboratory within this secure place, and because it's secure, we find that data owners, uh, cohort data controllers, are far more willing uh, to give approval for uh, data access. I think it's going quite well. We have 42 collaborating cohorts, and over the last two years or so, we've uh, received 182 uh, project proposals uh, from 30, 322 applicants in 20 countries, uh, 82 institutions. Overall, this works out at 690 cohort access applications. Uh, and again, uh, this is, a, I think, if you compare this with other uh, uh, similar uh, data repositories. This is a very high level of use. The beauty of, of course is that you can have one application to make requests to multiple cohorts. Uh, our decision time for, for an application, mean decision time from the data access committee is 26 days, sorry our median is 26 days, the median value of 36 days. And that's, this is actually a vast improvement over if you were applying the most cohorts individually. Let me just take you through this complexity called our data portal. Obviously, we have a data ingestion layer. And then we have a data curation layer, uh, which allows us to standardize the data. And then we work with other platforms around the globe, uh, particularly uh, the Alzheimer's disease workbench, uh, which uh, is being developed by Gates Ventures, to be able to link Deep UK with uh, GAIN in the States, with CPAD, um, with EMIF, um, with, with other data platforms around the globe. So that really from, from this one location, uh, obviously it has to be worked through and become uh, more efficient, but ne nevertheless in principle from this one location, uh, you'll be able to access uh, data globally. But you need to know what you're accessing. So we have a data discoverability layer uh, where we have data tools for finding out who has what in which location and what the, the access requirements are. And then we act as a, a broker, uh, enabling standard legal agreements to, to be uh, agreed uh, and therefore um, a rap more rapid access to the data that you want. That all boils down to enabling you to do the analyses you want to do. Uh, and the uh, data analysis environment is your own personal workspace. Um, it provides a whole lot of standard software, statistical software for um, your, your analyses, whether they be machine learning, standard regression techniques, cluster techniques. Uh, we can do, do most things actually. Um, and we're just building now a container-based system so that you're able to do a standard analysis in Deep UK, then transport that to another platform to repeat the analysis. And there is you know, absolute precision uh, in what you're doing. Uh, the next thing we're developing, we'll do that in the next year or two, is a knowledge environment where we will be recording the most frequently used codes on the most frequently used data sets um, uh, with uh, uh, identifiers, perpetual identifiers, that means that anybody can be able to call up a data set, pull up a code, replicate the study with absolute precision. 
we're very proud of the fact that we can do uh, multimodal analysis. Um, if you think about data, they're, they're very complex. Uh, survey data are complex, imaging data are complex, genetic data are complex. And really this uh, uh, makes it very hard to do analyses. Uh, it makes it very hard for a geneticist to do an analysis linking genetics to imaging, because although a geneticist may know all there is to know about the genetics data, he or she is probably not as familiar with imaging data. So effectively, we take raw, complex, high order uh, data, we pre-process it uh, to provide effectively flat files, and those flat files can be combined in the virtual laboratory environment, and uh, Sarah uh, will demonstrate that shortly. So I'm now going to hand over to Vanessa, who will speak to our precision recruitment arm of the study. Thank you, John. Um, so as, ja as, as John discussed at the, uh, at the beginning of his talk, um, one of the great aims of DPUK is to try and provide more effective and integrated uh, research platforms around dementia research. Um, within the data portal, we have an existing register for preclinical um, recruitment into dementia research, and this is part of an overarching trial delivery framework work stream of DPUK. Um, what that framework tries to provide is an integrated national framework where we're joining up um, preclinical cohorts, but in addition to that, potential clinical cohorts and trial delivery uh, centres. And, and in this, we're not trying to reinvent the wheel, we're trying to access existing infrastructure um, and present this in a more unified way across the UK so that we can help support more effect effective and rapid uh, recruitment into dementia studies. So the main um, platform we have for preclinical recruitment is the Clinical Studies Register. This is a recontact platform from existing DPUK cohort participants. Um, and as you can see from the slide, there's about 50,000 people currently within the Clinical Studies Register. And because of that existing cohort data, we have details on those participants on demographics, genetics and cognition. Uh, sitting within the, the Clinical Studies Register, nested within it, is the Great Minds cohort, which currently has about 3,000 plus participants. And these are people who have given explicit consent for recontact based on their risk for developing dementia. Uh, they've also agreed to have serial cognitive assessments, remote genotyping, and there are plans to do things like uh, actigraphy uh, and other assessments within that group. Uh, if you could move to the next slide, John. Um, so currently in terms of what, where those cohorts have come from, so the Clinical Studies Register currently consists um, of, of Airwave. We've also got Healthwise Wales on board. And as I said, the, the Great Minds cohort sits within the CSR uh, uh, the register. Uh, in terms of the amount of data we have on that 53,000, we've got health data on about 46,000 people, cognitive data on 31,000 and genotyping on about 20,000 with plans to expand that further. We're also looking at expanding into further uh, cohorts. So we're currently recruiting from two other UK cohorts and plans to do more. Um, and what we hope this preclinical register will provide, um, as I said, is the ability to provide stratified and effective recruitment into studies for preclinical populations. The other thing I want to mention that's not particularly uh, described on this slide is that the other arm of the trial delivery framework, as I said, is about clinical recruitment and identifying um, trial delivery centers across the UK that can be utilized for effective trial, effective and rapid uh, trial delivery. Um, so what we're planning to do over the next few months is a scoping exercise around clinical services, particularly research active clinical services. So these would be memory clinics across the UK. What we want to be able to do is to ask them about their existing registers, research registers, and see if there's a way that we can join those up um, within our trial delivery framework. It may be that they will become part of the clinical studies register or may, there may be a separate clinical cohort that's still to be decided. Um, and as I said, we're also gonna do a scoping exercise into existing trial delivery centers so that we start to create a network of both preclinical prodromal populations and trial delivery centers um, that they can, can then be utilized for dementia research. We've got some current studies lined up like the deep and frequent phenotyping study that we plan to uh, utilize these cohorts for, for recruitment. The other thing to mention that we hope to utilize this framework for is looking at standardizing assessments across clinical services. Um, I think COVID particularly has raised the fact that this is an issue for, from a clinical point of view, but in terms again of recruiting efficient um, 
clinical populations um, that can uh, be identified in a specific way for dementia studies, then obviously we need to think about standardising assessments in those centres. And we've got some partners already like Connectivity on board that we can consider in terms of the cognitive assessments we want to utilise. But again, that's an exercise we plan to um, move into in the next few months, identifying what kind of assessments we want to suggest are utilised in these clinical cohort centres. I'm going to hand back to John now. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Vanessa. So the, the client relations management system, uh, which we've taken some time to design, is really a way of uh, scientists using our data discovery tools to identify the people they want, and then us approaching those individuals um, without breaking any confidence uh, in order for them to say whether they would be interested in participating. So it's a, a, it's a secure, pretty fail-safe system for recontact without breaking confidentiality until the participants uh, say that they would like to take part, it be, would like to have more information. And at that point, we pass that on uh, to the researchers to uh, persuade them uh, to take part. So if I could just go on to my final slide now. One of the things that I'm really pleased with um, Deep UK is the industry partnership model. Um, we have nine academic partners, uh, but interestingly, 15 industry partners, by, and that includes pharma, biotech, and I use the term industry loosely because it also includes uh, philanthropy. We have uh, partnerships with uh, Air UK, Alzheimer's Society, and with Gates Ventures. And I, I think this just uh, suggests that uh, there is uh, a high level of trust in the sorts of work that we do, high level of confidence in it. I, I bring it down really to developing what I might describe as pre-competitive high trust networks, where it's not that um, uh, the academic partners go to the industry partners and say, can you fund us? Uh, and it's not that the industry partners come to the academic partners and say, we just want to know this, will you do it? Actually, we all sit in a room, and um, a, a, a metaphorical room, a virtual room these days, and work out what is an important question, because we share the scientific endeavor. We share ideas, data, technology, uh, and we recognize that everybody has important, an important uh, something to bring uh, to the party. And then, obviously, we share the success. Uh, we're flexible and agile. It's question-focused. And what we discover is that as people, as our industry partners and academic partners um, demonstrate that they can uh, uh, answer the question that they're interested in, so programs develop. So it's the development of uh, each program that we have uh, based on success. And finally, we have our core informatics structure, which allows us for all of our EM projects to, to have transparent and rapid data management and provides for the analysis of these complex data at multi multimodal uh, capability. So that's a brief overview. I'm going to leave it to James and John to talk in detail about the experimental medicine incubator. But right now, I'm going to hand over to Sarah, who will give a live demonstration of our data portal. Oh, hang on. Are there any questions for me? That's the first thing I need to ask. We don't see any questions at the moment, but uh, I will pick up uh, with you later if we have any. OK. OK, wonderful. Over to Sarah. Okay, so um, can everybody hear me okay? Can someone nod? Yep. Yes. Okay, so I'm just going to share my screen. Right. So um, when uh, applicants and uh, applicants to the data portal projects um, can vary uh, widely as far as industry. We have industry and academic um, applicants to, to the data portal. All we require is that they are bona fide researchers and we really do welcome a worldwide applicants to the data portal and indeed we do have well over 200 uh, researchers with projects across the data portal at the moment moment and by um, submitting a project proposal uh, through our application system 
which goes out to firstly a scientific review and then out to our cohort owners, you are able then to access data on the data portal. The data cannot be downloaded, but the data reside on the data, um, data portal within the data repository. So once you have gained um, a permission to access at least one of your cohorts of interest, we send you instructions to download the VMware Horizon client onto your desktop or your laptop. We also send you out instructions to download um, a Google Authenticate a verification code, a generator onto your mobile device. And this is how you will go through then a two-step login process to the data portal. So here we see the login um, page of the data portal, which I will go through now. So here you accept uh, the terms and conditions which you would have already signed up through your data access agreement. This is an agreement which you and all your collaborators will sign up as soon as you have a project approved for the data portal. So this is where you will put in your verification code which has been generated on your mobile device. And then you will be given a username and generate your own password. And this completes the two-step secure login process. Now, when you submit a project proposal to the data portal, you get the chance to um, request a size of a desktop. Now, by default, the floating desktop is eight gigabytes. Now, an eight gigabyte desktop is perfectly suitable for normal regression modeling and most statistical procedures. And this is the desktop that we will um, automatically give out to, um, to most applications. However, for those of you who want to do um, slightly more computationally intensive modeling or perhaps um, some basic machine learning model models, we, will, we also have the large desktop, which is 32 gigabytes. For those of you who want to do even more sophisticating, sophisticated modeling, such as latent class analyses and the more computationally intensive machine learning modeling, such as um, NLP modeling, we also have the extra large desktop, which is 128 gigabytes. We also have a Linux desktop with genetics and imaging capabilities um, for those of you who would like to undertake multimodal analyses. You'll also see here we have a Datathon desktop, which by default is a 32 gigabyte desktop. So although we will give you a desktop at the outset of your project, it doesn't mean to say we are inflexible to requirements. So for example, if you ask for a eight gigabyte desktop in the beginning, but you, ha you get halfway through your project and your um, analysis changes and you find that your desktop no, is no longer suitable for your needs, you can come back to us and say that um, you would you actually now require a larger desktop to suit the analyses which has evolved throughout your project. So here you can see uh, the data portal and it looks exactly the same as a desktop as if you were on your PC or your laptop. So all the statistical packages are pre-installed within the data portal. So as you can see, we have Stata, we have SPSS, we have Python, MATLAB, and we also have R. And these are free to use tools. And for those of you who know, for example, Stata can cost over 2000 pounds for a site license. This is a real bonus um, for uh, those users who do not have access to site and um, institutional licenses. So these are free and they are pre-installed within the desktop. If there are statistical packages which um, applicants start to ask us for, we will um, consider those and install them um, in the data portal uh, according to demand. So if we go into the file structure over here, you'll see 
Much like a normal desktop, we have um, a file structure over here. First of all, we, look, we have users. And if we go into here, you'll see that every applicant who is named on a project, so all co-applicants and main applicants, will have a project folder. Now, you can't go into any ones which, um, it, if it doesn't belong to you, you actually can't access it. But this is where you can do all your private work. So this is where you can um, store your own scripts and copies of your um, data. So, for example, if you have a master data set in the project folder, which I will show you now, this is where you make a copy of your data set and you work on it in your private space. This is also where you're able to write up, for example, your publication because uh, Microsoft Office is pre-installed, so you're able to do your writing work within your user folder. So this is your private space. We also have a resources um, file where you can actually log into a Linux interface through a PuTTY. We also have a SQL server. Over here, the Stata file is where the larger data sets are stored for those cohorts who um, have um, the Stata format for their data sets. So if we go into the project folders over here, you'll see that every DPUK project is listed. However, you cannot go into anyone's project. It, it access is denied. You can only go into a project which, which you are named on as a collaborator. So if we go into a project of my own over here, you'll see that all the cohorts which I have applied for for this project are listed within a single project um, structure here. You'll also notice that some of these projects are actually, some of these cohorts are actually not DPUK um, cohorts. So for example, SALSA, CARME, HRS and BHR uh, I have applied for outside of DPUK and with permission from the cohorts, I have loaded them up into the folder alongside the DPUK cohorts. And this is the advantage of the DPUK data portal. I am able to analyze other cohorts alongside the DPUK cohorts. Likewise, if a researcher is working on data of their own, they're able to load that up into the project folder. And when they finish the project, they take it away. These data sets do not belong to DPUK. It just affords the capabilities to analyze multiple cohorts side by side. So this project here is an example of a collaborative project where five analysts are working in a single space. They, these are the master data sets where they take copies and they work in their own space on their user, in the user um, space that they have to themselves. So if we go into um, an example over here, you'll see the capabilities of this particular desktop, which is the 128 uh, gigabyte desktop. So here I work in Stata, which is my software of choice, but many of my analysts happen to work in um, R or Python or MATLAB, for example. So if we open up the do fold folder over here, which um, we just find here, my do folder is not opening here. There we go. Just um, so um, this so in this space we can um, if we open up the um, if I just close this down I'm opening up the wrong um, function here. Um, you're able to um, write all your code and all um, and share the code um, within a single project uh, space and. I'm going into the wrong folder here. I do apologize here. Um, I've, I've opened up my do file and it is not opening for me. But this is where you can um, share code and open it up. And um, I'm going to open it up differently over here. And um, so you'll see you can work in one collaborative space and, and process and standardize all your code and each, and each of the collaborators within one project folder can um, then utilize the code and um, you will be able to save time by sharing with each other because you all have access within the one project folder. Now here I've run a um, 
structural equation model, which is quite computationally intensive. And you can see that the 128 gigabyte desktop is perfectly capable of conducting a multiple structural equation model such as this within this size desktop. Now, equally so, that to run a multi multimodal analysis, we can just simply switch to a, um, another desktop, such as the Linux desktop. So, and like, this is very easy to do by just switching over. Now, if you've uh, submitted a um, application for um, multimodal analytics, you will be uh, allowed to have a Linux desktop, for example. And for those of you familiar with um, uh, Linux, in this uh, case, we have um, Ubuntu as the flavor. And the project folders are exactly the same as the uh, Windows. So you can't go into anyone else's project folder, but it's exactly the same. So over here, we have some images which um, the analyst on this project has um, uploaded the raw images into the project folder. She has pre-processed them within the project folder and um, she's able to analyze these um, images within the data portal, but this is sitting just in front of the extra large desktop. So if we just So this analyst has asked to use FSL to analyze her image data, but likewise, if um, an analyst comes to us and asks to use, for example, SPM, we will um, like we will upload that that software for that analyst. So um, if we just open up. Um, And here we select the images like you would on a normal desktop. And there we have the images as you would on, on a desktop, except in, this time you're in a virtual desktop space. And importantly, what you would like to do is extract the, the metrics from these images and then insert them into the model on your extra large desktop. So if we just um, So here we have um, metrics and then we can just simply switch back to easily back to our extra large desktop and insert our metrics from our uh, multimodal imaging analyses on the uh, Linux desktop. And likewise with genetic data, importantly, we can just simply switch back to the uh, Linux desktop. And over here we have some UK Biobank uh, genetic data over in our um, shared folder. So we'll go down to, um, here we have Biobank genetic data. And here our analyst has decrypted the data and again, extracted the data for analysis purposes and quite easily can switch back to the extra large desktop to insert that into the model and run a multimodal analysis. So importantly, although you can't extract data off of the data portal, you are able to extract figures, data uh, figures, tables, and output for publication and presentation purposes. So if we just save this figure to the desktop as an example, we have a files in out function. So although we, you don't have any connection to the internet through the data portal, you can extract output. So if you just enter in your username and again the password, and here we request simply files out, and we select the file that we would like to extract off the data portal. Here we have a figure. 
we select the project that we are um, we are um, this is connected to and this is a figure for presentation We certify that we're not removing any data from the data portal and we simply send the request. So there you can see how the data portal is capable of um, conducting multimodal data an analyses from um, running um, genetic imaging and survey analyses and extracting output for publication and presentation purposes. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Sarah. Thank you, John. Uh, we have a, a question from Shlomi. Um, I think you partially covered that during your talk, Sarah, but uh, which files, codes, stats, plots can I push in and pull out of the portal and how? Okay. Is there any limitation in terms of codes that you can uh, use or can you import in the portal? Yes, so for taking out the data portal, as I just mentioned, you can take out all figures, tables, but also likewise for bringing into the data portal, you can import any scripts um, that you have outside of the data portal and these are automatically approved. So they go through a malware screening to make sure that no viruses are being imported into the data portal. But for taking out of the data portal, these have to be approved just to make sure that um, no data are being removed from the data portal. Maybe I will ask another question, maybe just uh, for our researchers. I mean, how does it work? I mean, how does the evaluation of the, the application work? Uh, if somebody you know, would like to have some analysis um, of some of your cohorts, what type of criteria are you looking for you know, what in uh, the scientific committee that evaluates this type of applications? Okay, so for the DP, DPUK, what we do um, is we just do an initial scientific integrity um, screening. So what we're looking for really is we're looking for a um, scientifically sensible and complete application. So we're looking um, that for um, that there is an analysis plan. We're looking that the um, analyses, uh, the actual application is complete, that appropriate cohorts have been selected selected for the research question and that uh, the variables are matching the research question and that some selection has taken place. But the actual approval process is up to the cohorts themselves. So Giovanna, what we, what we, try, something, John. Yes. Yes, what we, what we try and do is avoid sending egregious proposals to the cohort owners because it just annoys them, frankly. You know, if somebody says, give me all your data. They don't quite like it. Uh, so we have this screening process so that when a proposal does go to a cohort owner, it's highly likely to succeed uh, and highly unlikely to annoy. And, and I think it's just a matter of courtesy uh, to the people who've spent, you know, 10, 20 years of their lives uh, collecting these data to show the data some respect. Can you give us just a few examples of the type of studies that you have uh, seen, uh, you know, from uh, good applications so far uh, that have uh, got some interesting insights from uh, in the analysis of cohorts, just that our researchers can have an, an idea. Let me give you an example of a bad one and then Sarah can give you an example of a good one. That can be uh, useful so, too. <laughs> so we had a request uh, from uh, a, a, a university from, else, from, another, from another country <laughs> Um, which effectively was so big, it would have used up all our capacity for the next three months uh, and um, uh, nobody else would have been able to use the portal. So needless to say, that, that, that had a, a terse response. Um, and as I say, we've also, we've also had requests which effectively just ask for everything. And it's very clear that the, the, the scientist making the request has not done any homework at all on whether this cohort is really suitable for the hypothesis test. So we, 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 we but we do help them, you know, uh, we do then suggest how it can be improved because we try to be constructive. Uh, we, we're trying to just improve the quality of science all around. So those, those are the bad ones. Now over to Sarah for the good ones. Um, I think what we try to do is one of our first sections in the application form is public benefit. 
And we've inserted public benefit as the first section on purpose because we really do want our researchers to think about the benefits of their research. Why are they doing it? And um, I, I think that um, a good application has really thought through this section. Um, they're not just submitting it because they, they, they see the data portal as a candy shop where you know they're just simply attracted by all the data and also um, a good analysis plan that ties in with the research question um, so um, that is really important as well that if they're going to um, use the longitudinal data and they haven't actually set, stated how they're going to analyze the data longitudinally then that would not um, that would not be a good um, indication to the cohorts that they're making good use of the data. Okay, thank you John and Sarah and um, I think uh, there are no more questions for the moment so maybe James can go ahead with his uh, slides with the same background you're very you're branded too. Hi James. You're mute James. There we are. Um, I'm just giving a moment. Hopefully, this yeah, will bring up nice the slides. <laughs> but yes, sorry, there goes the dog. I hope you can see a slide saying experimental medicine. Yeah, we do. Thanks. Fantastic. So, this is, uh, I did this, this section within the DPUK jointly with John Isaac, who's uh, also online from JJ Innovations. And I thought I'd give a little talk of some of the background thinking behind it and then some examples and then coming towards the end about how we can link up better across uh, the, the DPUK and DOI and indeed the, the Drug Discovery Alliance. One often sees scheme about translational medicine of this kind of format where on the left genetics and cell and molecular biology link through to uh, early animal models and late preclinical models and eventually bringing into to the humans in clinical trials. There's many variations on this schema uh, and with sort of eventual feedback with that top loop feeding back to the early stages. But there's a problem or there's a barrier in this schema at this point, about at the point at which uh, work comes into the human species. It's the point at which the success rate for new compounds drops off, one, two, if you're lucky, three percent of trials might succeed. But the costs also escalate enormously. Phase two trial might be between five and $50 million um, dollars, uh, and a phase three trial 10 times that. So there's a sort of catastrophic pinch point or bottleneck here, uh, which needs to be opened up to, to streamline and make the process more effective. But in doing that, there's a number of challenges, particularly when one thinks about the human organism uh, as the basis for experimental research. Now, part of that is the, the fundamental biology that the what happens over an 80 years of a lifespan for an organism, humans who have more complex genetics and their preclinical models uh, governing even homologous processes of inflammation and, um, and protostasis, for example, may have more complex regulation. But there are also things that people do in their environment over the lifespan, education and reserve and so on. And all this adds up to a problem of heterogeneity. And this puts uh, some special constraints uh, and uh, some special factors in how we would design human experimental medicine studies, whether observational cohorts or interventional trials. People also do things that they shouldn't with it, drinking, eating, smoking, overweight and so on, which all take their toll in comorbidity. And I think the comorbidity is a huge factor uh, in human dementia research in the way that it might be lagging behind to some of the preclinical models. Uh, one's very lucky in being able to control so many factors of environment and genetics uh, that some of these comorbidities might be ironed out in experimental models. Um, and it's very difficult to do that if one wants representative human studies. There's a third factor, which is the very nature of the dementia, the cognitive impairment in people, uh, has some things that may not have their analogues in, in preclinical models, some forms of memory, language, personality, social communication. These are fundamental to the experience and quality of life of people affected by dementia, but they're not endpoints that have uh, sort of simple analogues uh, in, in preclinical models. But it's never too soon for us to start thinking about whether the intermediate biological markers are relevant to endpoints that will eventually matter to patients. In other words, are, are we collectively shooting at the right target, even if the experimental 
uh, work needs to use intermediates. So these are some of the factors that, that shape the way that experimental medicine uh, and human studies are undertaken. The back, sort of consequence of all this is that uh, we in, in academic centres and across the pharma companies have a common set of problems. And this lies behind the pre-competitive nature of, of the of deeper UK. And that is really uh, across many new treatments, I put plural there, there's a common problem that we need to show that their targets are valid in humans, either people with dementia or those at risk of dementia. And it helps to also have evidence that the, the pathway or the target relates to the phenotype, whether that's to do with the, uh, the type or expression of disease um, or, or the progression of dementia, progression of clinical symptoms. And the third thing which is needed, and again, there's a lot of background work in DPUK1 has gone into this and it's, it's ongoing, is to develop and validate the quantitative tools that will demonstrate efficacy in early phase trials. So not late phase trials, we're not a contract research organization, we're not talking about phase three trials, but try looking at early stage trials, or indeed those tools that will help stratify patients. And together, these lead to de-risking of the drug development process, looking for what are the ways that would give indicators of change, of benefit, I should say, of relevant disease processes, relevant to the patient and relevant to the compound in question, in relevant cases, to give the confidence for pharma or academic uh, sites to continue working with the drug, or perhaps even more importantly, the confidence to discontinue a particular line of inquiry. So these, these are common problems. This is not restricted to one particular compound or one company. And so there's a pre-competitive partnership. Uh, and I very much hope this will broaden increasingly uh, between DPUK and DOI uh, members. Within this, uh, some of the projects I'll touch on in a moment really reflect innovation of first-in-man studies, high, highly novel human experimental work. But there's also an aspect we mustn't forget, and that is uh, really benchmarking these new tools uh, for readiness for phase two trials. Are they scalable to multiple sites? Are they reliable? So simple test, retest work. Are they operational in a time and cost effective manner? Uh, this, this is a sort of slightly grunt work, brute force work, um, but it's, it may not be particularly sexy work just to show reliability and uh, scalability, but it's really, really important to make any of the uh, new compounds and new sort of clinical trial designs work. Um, so it, it's, uh, it might be a little bit boring, but it's just, it's just as important as the innovative science uh, in its own right. So in, in developing the program of Deeper UK uh, Experimental Medicine, we settled some years ago on sort of three main strands, three priorities. Uh, this has reached not, not internally, but through a series of consensus meetings of academic and pharma partners, uh, PPI and, and charity funders. And they settled on these three themes of vascular health, synaptic health and immunology, which I'll talk through in a moment. I think we're really, really pleased that over the subsequent years, these have been picked up and, and mirrored in some of the structures of DRI. So if we, if we look at the DPUK themes, I've shown here some of the, the PIs on the themes going forward, uh, I've highlighted in, in bold uh, the members of the DRI. And so I think this already gives some sort of uh, uh, initial contacts uh, of this overlap uh, and, a, and a common understanding between DRI and DPUK. I hope is again going forward, this will grow and mature and uh, we'll really get much richer interactions. Uh, to take that forward, uh, we're hoping to, to plan some within the theme but cross institutional meetings. Um, so for each of these three themes to get the, the groups together from DRI and DPUK uh, to talk in a, in a workshop format, it's obviously slightly overtaken by the need to work remotely through uh, Zoom rather than face-to-face -face meetings for the next few months. But we hope to really build those bridges on top of having some investigators who are uh, individually in both organisations. Before I come to some uh, particular examples of the work under these three themes, does anybody have any questions about the sort of the, the background organisation or set up or, or teams? There doesn't seem to be any question at the moment, so please go ahead and okay. repeat them yeah. up later. So I'll just start, start with examples of synaptic health. Uh, I mean, it's clear that synaptic loss is loss of, and loss of synaptic plasticity is an early event in Alzheimer's disease and other, other dementias. Um, and it's also a mechanism, perhaps, of a um, therapeutic target to, to maintain or restore synaptic function. So one of the projects within DPUK uh, is called, called NTAD New Therapeutics in Alzheimer's. 
Uh, and essentially, this is built around the idea of this cascade shown in the, the box diagram at the top as we move from left to right, that the initiating events perhaps of amyloid and, and tau-based toxicity, both to the cell and to the synapse, between them, so between the cell death and synaptic function, alter network dynamics. It's very interesting, this is not only a, a left to right unidirectional process, the network dynamics made in cells shape the, the propagation and spread of the pathology. But it's the loss of network dynamics um, that really leads to the cognitive change. Um, and so what we'd like to do is to be able to measure not just massive cell death and atrophy with MR, but to move uh, towards the left, as it were, towards uh, synaptic dysfunction. And we can do that with MEG. So the little inset figure there is, is one of our postdocs in the MEG undertaking a, a cognitive paradigm. Uh, and it measures the uh, neural activity and oscillatory dynamics. It's rather like uh, uh, EEG, but uh, with some uh, mechanistic advantages. So this study is taking 100 patients with MCI and early AD, at baseline and at 12 months. We're looking at progression markers. We're coupling it with neuropsychology to phenotype the, the cognitive syndrome, high quality MRI and CSF and blood. And this may be a particular point uh, of overlap between the, the groups in DRI and deeper UK, looking at synaptosomic and uh, serological markers. One of the reasons MEG is very useful is just illustrated at the bottom diet figure. Uh, the, the, the middle and left hand sort of coloured panels are illustrating the, the power spectrum recorded from the patients and these have direct homologues to, to preclinical electrophysiological recordings, uh, whether in vivo or ex vivo slices, and also can support quite detailed biophysical modelling of cortical networks, just illustrated on, on the right there. So this is really an, an MEG uh, imaging plus uh, Im so imaging enhanced uh, study. Another way to look at imaging is to try and tap into the pathology more directly. We're now going to draw a lot on PET and Deep UK in the last few years has invested a lot in a PET and PET MR network across sites across the UK that John touched on in his opening slides. One of the uh, PET leaders that's causing a lot of excitement at the moment is called UCBJ. Uh, UCB is now one of the partners in, in Deep UK2. And this binds to the synaptic vesicle protein 2A. Uh, which is presynaptic, just illustrated in the synaptic diagram on, on the left there, is ubiquitously expressed in cortex and is typically taken as um, a marker of synaptic density. Now there's a few caveats to that, but we'll, we'll take it for the moment uh, as an analogue of synaptic density. It correlates extremely highly with synaptophysin uh, in post-mortem and ex vivo studies. And if we take this into humans, so just showing here, this is from a deep UK related study called Mind Maps. Uh, on the left is a mouse uh, with autoradiography from the ligand, on the right is a patient, and you see this very clear cortical ribbon. Uh, and just the little um, scatter plot on the right is to remind me to say that in patients with early Alzheimer's disease, this is reduced, synaptic density is reduced about 20% overall throughout the cortex and up to 40% uh, in the hippocampus. But it's not only Alzheimer's disease, we've been using this within the theme in, in other tauropathies, so um, uh, four repeat tauropathies, um, which in the clinical contact would be progressive supranuclear palsy and cortical based degeneration. So one can see here in the bottom left, not only is this very abnormal in both of those four repeat tauropathies, but the severity of the UCBJ um, reduction, so synaptic reduction, if you like, correlates with disease severity over and above atrophy corrections. This is telling us more than, than atrophy. So the UCBJ in this related to SV2A uh, target is pre-synaptic and there's actually uh, even more interest perhaps in, in the hopes for post-synaptic markers. There's no human ligand for PSD95, for example, that would be wonderful, but we, we do have uh, privileged access to this new ligand uh, from uh, J&J which looks at the um, transmembrane uh, amp receptor uh, moderator, receptor protein uh, modulator, the gamma rate TARP uh, ligand. And this has been developed uh, by our partners, J&J, &J, and will be taking this forward into the first in dementia studies. And this is expressed intensely in the hippocampus. So the little image here shows an axial view, so a sort of horizontal view. Um, and you can see that in bright red, the hippocampus in, in a, a side view, uh, you also see that hippocampus in bright red coming down the temporal lobe. 
what's nice about the ECBJ and, and this uh, new gamete uh, TARP AMPA receptor uh, ligand is that it enables uh, homologous studies looking at preclinical models and patients under the same common framework using the same uh, ligands to, to map the density of the receptors pre and postsynaptically and with physiological recording, uh, MEG in humans uh, and uh, electrophysiological recording in, in the mouse models. So we're really trying to build these bridges between the levels uh, of, of analysis of the dementia. So in the next slide, I'm going to change tack to the second group within in the EM theme of neuroimmunology. Um, and I'm very aware that there's an immunology group in the DOI, and uh, so I'm not going to go over all, all the background evidence as to why it's are, are of interest in relation to dementia. Um, but it is sufficient to say there's, there is already um, compounds coming into clinical trials that are immunomoderators uh, aiming to delay or, or treat uh, Alzheimer's disease and uh, related dementias. But we really don't understand enough about the timing and the nature of the information in, in human dementias. So I think a lot of the uh, Im new immunology theme is trying to piece together the story of the relevance and the role of immune dysregulation in human dementia progression. So as I'm just showing a pilot date here, this is data, this is from um, peripheral EBMCs, uh, looking at immunophenotyping, uh, and of course a wide range of leukocytes, the differences between patients and controls, and they collectively, shown in the multidimensional scaling plot, collectively give very clear differentiation uh, between patients and uh, healthy controls. So this is this now being extended going as we go forward scaling up into a much larger study. But the other way to think about uh, the new immunology story uh, is with a concrete example where there's already um, uh, DRI and DPUK collaboration with a lot of crossover in staff and a joint program effectively which is looking at pathway specific polygenic risk scores for Alzheimer's disease and the comorbidities associated with inflammation. And this draws partly on the cohort uh, data. So from the um, International Genomics of Alzheimer's Project, nearly 100,000 um, uh, patient participants or samples there uh, coming through the DPUK, uh, re-imaged cohort of 10,000 in the biobank and cross-referring to uh, some of the patient databases in add nearly 1,000 genomes. So it's being able to get some precision through the patient data uh, on a modest scale, but then scale up to the population level through the pool to cohort data. It's a very powerful mechanism and to, uh, to get new insights and, and to validate them. So as they look forward into the next few years, they'll be looking for how the polygenic risk scores related to inflammatory pathways alter the risk of dementia, the rate of progression, and those aren't the same thing, um, but also then looking at how they relate to imaging markers uh, of uh, neurodegeneration with serial imaging. Uh, trying to like, build up this validation on the intermediate uh, endpoint of imaging, uh, which is in some ways gives greater uh, precision um, uh, and is a very powerful mechanism, assuming that it, it's valid to take that as a surrogate for cognitive impairment. As I mentioned, the immunophenotyping itself will be scaled up. So there's a study looking at for Alzheimer's disease, Lewy body dementia and controls uh, with the numbers there with peripheral um, PBMC immunophenotype immunoprofiling some more detailed cytokine and proteomic analysis, but importantly linking that to these clinical endpoints of cognition, uh, structural brain change, and longitudinal change over three years. So it's not, not enough to show correlations at baseline. We need to understand the relationships to disease progression, not least to allow uh, modeling and planning uh, in silico uh, development of, of trial designs. And that needs longitudinal data. Uh, it's, it's a perennial catch for medical working in human data that you simply cannot rely on cross-sectional correlations to infer progression. So a correlation with severity at baseline doesn't reliably tell you about longitudinal progression within individuals. So we're really trying to move towards the, the true longitudinal designs. Uh, if I come back to the role of, of imaging and PET, which I touched on before, uh, it's been known for many years that this can be imaged uh, with PET using TSPO ligands. These uh, TSPO is a translocator protein on the microglia uh, uh, mitochondria. And there's a number of ligands, PK1195 is most commonly used, but there are second generation ligands which have some advantages. And for, over the recent years, it's shown that this microglia activation is increased in all the major dementias. Uh, and it's been recently shown that it predicts future decline, so it predicts the rate at which you decline. So more information, you have a more rapid deterioration and follow-up. 
uh, and there's some very important sort of post-mortem correlations that validate this, this relationship uh, with the disease uh, and the uh, protein aspects in tau and amyloid of uh, the diseases. However, there's some uh, caveats with this, uh, all these ligands and the indirect link through the TSPO to, to microglial activation uh, and non-microglial, non that's astrocytic involvement. So we're very pleased that the um, uh, Janssen j and have given access to this new ligand which binds to the P2X7 receptor, which is a surface receptor uh, on activated microglia. It only emerges in activated microglia. And although it's been used in humans before, the studies with DPUK will be the first in use in the context of dementia, relating it both to the progression of neurodegeneration and Alzheimer's disease, but also uh, how this relates to vascular dementia and the response to ischemic insults in, in small vessel disease. So this brings me nicely to the third strand, which is vascular health. Um, and I should actually highlight, although these are we've talked about as three separate themes, synaptic, vascular and immunology, I think we all recognise that these are highly synergistic processes um, and the groups uh, within DPK talk to each other and I think we will be increasingly looking to, to draw on expertise and, and interact with the DRI because these three processes interact with each other and, and degeneration. But, but sticking to the sort of the nominal sort of three different divisions, uh, the vascular health team um, is really looking for vascular targets uh, as tractable, uh, imminent and uh, proximate targets for treatment and prevention of, of cognitive decline. They as a group have been over some years developing large scale observational cohorts and, uh, and a history of uh, effective clinical trials. But the basic route that we're taking in the first wave uh, of DPUK2 is to use phenomic wide association studies linking um, through the data portal and, and large scale data sets, 10, 20, 100,000 strong, the relationships between uh, etiological factors, underlying genes, and medication to the risks of, of disease progression or dementia progression, identifying drugs that may be, um, uh, again, proximate uh, or, or readily available mechanisms to, to, to treat and prevent dementia and then validating those in some more bespoke cohorts, particularly with vascular dementia and post-stroke, drawing up a, a short list where there's a very strong evidence base before going to confirmatory trials illustrated here just in the green box. So how this takes place, well, part of it is to, to build the evidence base for what I'll call imaging intermediates, that the, the readily um, quantifiable and observable state that it's a correlate of vascular dementia uh, are the changes on, on uh, MRI, this is white matter hyperintensities, changes in brain volume, changes in diffusion properties of white matter, microbleeds and so on. And these can be looked for in relation to genetic and lifestyle and comorbidity predictors. Still as correlations, these aren't, at the moment these will just be correlative, not causal, but it is something that these measures one can then take to, to test in a more bespoke 2000 strong um, I would say perhaps only 2,000. This is actually an enormous um, clinical cohort to have acquired with the depth of phenotyping for the R4VAD study of cognitive decline following stroke. Still looking at, cause, uh, at uh, correlations, but then moving in the next step to understanding causal relationships. So again, drawing on the portal data um, and using this relationship between genetics and intermediate phenotypes. They'll be using Mendelian randomization to try and ascertain the causal associations between known risk factors and the dementia related outcomes. Uh, so in a little box at the bottom, this is to really remind us how the, the Mendelian randomization can try and identify the, the causal associations between conventional risk factors, diabetes, hypercholesterolemia, high blood pressure and so on, but also perhaps of greater interest here are some novel pathways of inflammation, uh, endothelial change and hemostasis. And how, to, how those factors relate to the brain imaging surrogates or indices of vascular health, so lacuna infarct, atrophy, white matter hyperintensities, and so on. Now, there's some preliminary evidence this is the success of this. So, one of the recent studies looking at hemostatic factors in relation to stroke, identifying uh, protein C as a likely causal uh, um, association between hemostasis and stroke rather than just a correlation or, or post hoc artifact. So I've touched on three, three separate lines of, of inquiry uh, in these groups. At the end of the day, it's a very simple question to ask, well, yeah, that's all very well, but, but what, is the, what is the best way to know if a drug works? 
you know, um, instead of trying one test here or one test there, or a scan or a blood test or CSF, um, really we need to compare these like for like in a head to head test. And one of the, the flagship studies in DPUK is called Deep and Frequent Phenotyping, um, which has a lot of complexity to it, but the, the main question I think is very simple. It's just saying what is the best and fastest way to track disease and to build a design that would be the quickest and the fastest way to know if your, your drug is working or, as I said, probably not working. So you can kill off drug lines, uh, uh, drug de development uh, and uh, divert resources to where it's more likely to be effective. And the deep and frequent study uh, will have, uh, it's just, it has just started before COVID lockdown, but it has technically started. Um, and it really pitches a wide range of technologies. Some are obvious, like uh, blood and spinal fluid and MRI cognition. Some are less obvious, uh, like some of the digital wearables technologies, retinal imaging um, and, and MEG that we, we touched on earlier. And these will be running in parallel uh, in 250 people side by side uh, with repeat measurements over a year. And essentially it then becomes an informatics head-to-head. Uh, -head. Um, well, there'll be a lot to learn about the mechanisms, but there'll be a headline figure, which is which set of techniques together or in, uh, in isolation are, are the best to build your early go-no-go no -go, uh, go -no -go signals on. So it needs to say all, all of this work and indeed the three separate themes, synaptic, vascular and immunology health, it's the work of a very large number of people. I've not been naming names as we go through. It really is the work of a, of a large team. Um, of course, on this list of the DPUK partners, there's some obvious people missing and that includes, I think, the DRI uh, and, and the Drug Discovery Alliance. Uh, over, over recent years, we've seen various forms of this diagram, again, reflecting that left to right translational pathway um, of, of biochemistry and molecular biology through preclinical model systems into patients. And one sometimes sees versions of this unidirectional arrow. I think it's slightly better to see it as, as at least a bi-directional exchange. And I think actually be much better to see this as a more collective enterprise uh, with reciprocal interactions, uh, very liberal exchange of, of ideas and samples, uh, thoughts. There should be no surprises at any point in this pathway. We, we would want to understand what's coming through, um, that we need to think about having the, the technologies in place to test in, in a year or two as new compounds come through. Uh, and I hope we'll be able to feed back some information about what is most relevant for, for patient outcomes. So I thought I'd just touch on uh, some literature. I thought if I looked at the literature on my final slide, I always find the Daily Express a useful source of information. Um, the several th these two uh, headlines, I think, say, say a lot. One is that we share a common vision of this is a, this is a tractable target um, and that dementia Alzheimer's can be defeated. That there's a common aim, I think, also not just to treat and respond to the disease, but to prevent it, to identify and treat and divert the course of pathogenesis before symptoms. There's another aspect in this, in this uh, newspapers, which is uh, about repurposing. And not all drugs will be repurposed, but I think there's a lot of scope to be re to repurpose drugs. Um, but while our eyes are clearly on the horizon, we need our feet firmly on the ground and we should be wary of um, perhaps some of the, the hype and overinflated expectations and just take a steady, uh, cold-headed approach to, to each step forward. And on that, I'm very happy to, to take any, any questions. There is one question here from Caleb uh, Weber. Yes. Um, has polygenic or any genetic risk been used to select the cohort of 250 in the deep and frequent phenotyping cohort? If so, how? Uh, yes, um, so those exact plans have changed over the years. Um, I think when the study was originally conceived, it would be um, a polygenic risk score looking at, uh, I think it was the top 12 to 15 or so, uh, a genetic association of Alzheimer's disease, trying to draw in people with a very high chance of Alzheimer's versus those with a very low chance. And there would be a four to one recruitment ratio, uh, bringing them people in for uh, PIB amyloid imaging and ultimately selecting those who have no symptoms but have uh, either do or don't have Alzheimer's pathology. I think in the latest iteration that is reduced to a much simpler polygenetic risk score, um, polygenetic risk score, um, obviously APOE4 is the biggest by far factor but I'd have to check offline and get back to you on what the other genes are in, in the BOS. It has been simplified, I think, considerably because the effect sizes are so small. Uh, 
Yeah, so Caleb is also asking, are IPSC lines from the 250 available? Uh, um, so they will exist uh, for some of them. Um, uh, I don't control those, but we can connect up to, to, uh, to who the right people would be to talk about what, what those are and uh, how they'll be handled. But they're not part in the, of the DPUK stem cell network? No. Um, I would need to check. I, my, John, do you know if the deep, deeper frequent yeah, IPSC the, will come through the... Yeah, for the pilot study, uh, they yeah. will, for certain. Yeah. Um, for the main study, I expect they will. Uh, but, you know, to be honest, until they're successfully collected, it's a bit of an unknown quantity. Yeah, sure. But, I mean, I'm, I'm sure that would be a very valuable resource. I think uh, there are no other questions for the moment, but please uh, keep writing your questions and we can pick them up at the end. Uh, yeah. Thank you. John, I guess it's up to you now to close. Yeah. Um, how long have I got, Giovanna, before I need to shut up? Uh, we are uh, until 3.30. We have some time, but uh, go ahead. All right. Okay. I'll try and do this in 15 minutes. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. Right, okay. Um, let's get rid of that. Okay, thanks. So, um, thanks, James. Um, and obviously, a great introduction to the experimental medicine work packages. Um, so, as Giovanna mentioned earlier on, I, I co lead the synaptic health work package with James. And um, We've, also, we've been doing this together for quite a while now. Um, and what I wanted to talk to you about was just some of the, going into some of the mechanistic studies that are planned for the synaptic health uh, work package under DPUK2. And the reason being really is so that we can give you a sense of, of, of some of the preclinical sort of mechanistic work, which um, is also being uh, put together as part of DPUK2. And the opportunity, I think, to highlight the, the connection between the more clinical focused DPUK work and the more mechanistic um, uh, work that DRI does. And I think this is an example of where this can be bridged. And this is not the only example, um, as James has mentioned, in your immunology um, experimental medicine theme, there's also um, collaboration with DRI going. Um, but I want to just give you a sense for, for how, how this, this is being thought about. So, so this is the sort of overall um, picture of the uh, synaptic health work package. And James has gone through this at high level um, already. So there's a, a clinical component, which is um, the first part of the work package, which is looking at these two uh, PET ligands in um, Alzheimer's disease patients. These are uh, mild to moderate Alzheimer's disease patients. Looking at the SB2A PET ligand, UCBJ. Um, I'll talk a bit about that in a moment. And then also looking at, uh, in some studies, starting to look at this novel, um, uh, TARP gamma 8 associated amp receptor PET ligand. Uh, I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, and you know, obviously that's going to be done in a clinic, but the, what I want to talk about was the second part, which is the second part of the work package, which is the preclinical mechanistic work, which I think is really important to link um, a better understanding of what these PET ligand changes mean back to the basic biology uh, in the brain and ultimately link it back to what type of interventions therapeutic interventions one would want to do in the clinic and when uh, during the disease course one would bring these um, therapeutic interventions to bear and obviously the most um, proximal result of that is to do much more precise clinical trials with a much higher chance of detecting uh, uh, beneficial effects and of course as we know in Alzheimer's disease that would be a wonderful thing after many 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 years of failure um, and so that's really where we're really, really pushing hard. And that's where I think DPUK really brings max, you know, great value. And the collaboration between DPUK and DRI, I think, is a, would be a really fantastic um, interface to really drive this forwards. And as James mentioned, there's many partners involved in this and these discussions about the Snappy Health work package, as well as the other experimental work packages, have been ongoing um, during the uh, DP, original DPUK grant as, as a form of workshops and this particular um, project has, has really taken, um, you know, a, a number of years of discussions to um, to line it up um, uh, in, in readiness for DPUK um, renewal submission. So hopefully, oh there we go, great. 
Okay, so, so this, is, this is the fundamental problem uh, that at least um, one can see uh, with, with, with just doing either a clinical or a preclinical study is you don't know the relationship between some of the things you can measure in a human and some of the things you can measure in an animal. Um, and so obviously what we really care about in humans is slowing cognitive decline or preventing it. Um, we can measure in humans, we can measure cognition in humans, and now with the advent of these novel PET ligands, which I think are a really important uh, step forward in the field, one can start to measure the expression of molecular targets using PET uh, imaging in, in humans. What we can't measure in humans is synaptic transmission. Um, and if we're interested in synapses, at some point we need to measure synaptic transmission. And particularly if we're trying to develop therapeutics that intervene with loss of synaptic transmission uh, and prevents it or even recovers loss of synaptic transmission, we absolutely need to know what the relationships are between these three signals. And so you can imagine a scenario where you go and look at patients and there's a very small change in cognition a large change in a synaptic PET signal. And you might then conclude that, first of all, that synapses have nothing to do with cognition, which hopefully most of you wouldn't agree with. Um, but but what you, you might also wonder what is the relationship between the PET signal and cognition. And, and so it might be sublinear. So you get a thresholding effect whereby the brain can put up with a quite a considerable loss of a synaptic PET signal before you start to see a cognitive impact. And, and that's a pretty common feature of the brain, right? That you, you get um, uh, thresholding effects. The brain is a very robust system. It can put up with quite a lot of loss uh, of, of, of cells, um, receptors, before you see clinical symptoms. A great example of that is Parkinson's disease. When people start to show um, clinical symptoms of Parkinson's disease, they've lost about 70% of their dopaminergic neurons in the brain. And obviously, you like to intervene before you've lost 70% of dopaminergic neurons. And similarly, in Alzheimer's disease, we'd like to intervene before we've lost a, a large fraction of synapses. And the second thing, uh, example is, is you go to this end of the spectrum where you've got all, essentially no PET signal left, or almost no PET signal left, um, uh, and you've got only some synaptic transmission left. And again, you've got a fairly modest effect on cognition. But you might, so you might, if you just looked at the PET signal, think, well, there's no point in intervening at all in synaptic transmission because you've essentially lost almost all your, your PET signal. But actually, you, you do actually have quite a lot of synapses left to work with. And this is sort of a bit more akin to what one thinks about in Parkinson's disease, for example. And so I think it's, it's absolutely critical to understand the relationship between these signals. And of course, this is hypothetical. Um, you could produce other lines and squiggly lines for this, but just illustrating this point. Unfortunately, we actually do have some data relating cognition to PET signals with SV2A, and that's really what started the excitement around this area and why this has been such a, a great interest, not only to the synaptic health group, but also others are, are working on this as well. But the key feature for this program, in the clinical program, is longitudinal data. So it's following um, patients with, with, at least with the PET signals and measures of cognition, and then um, following an analogous neurodegeneration and tauopathy models um, in the preclinical studies. And that is a key feature, and it's much, obviously much more powerful than doing cross-sectional studies, which is what's been done so far um, in the clinic, and, and also is largely what's been done in, in, um, in animal models as well. So these are the two ligands that, that James already mentioned. So in red here um, is SV2A. So UCBJ is a PET ligand that binds the SV2A protein, which is found on uh, uh, all synaptic vesicles in the brain. Um, it's the site of the drug levetiracetam, which is a, 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 a clinically used anti-epileptic, and there's a newer version, brevetiracetam, which is also a clinically used anti-epileptic. Um, we don't really understand how these molecules work. They, they somehow modulate um, uh, SP2A functions such that it reduces uh, synaptic transmission under hyperexcitability um, conditions in epilepsy patients, but that's pretty much all we know at the moment. But it's a great PET ligand. Um, on the other side, uh, if you want to measure excitatory transmission and postsynaptically, we actually, until recently, haven't really had a lot to work with. And the, um, the PET ligand that, that uh, James already mentioned, which is this TARP gamma 8 selective ligand that binds the TARP gamma 8 associated AMP receptor, found selectively in the forebrain and actually highly enriched in hippocampus, is what was developed recently um, uh, by, by J&J. And actually, Eli Lilly has also developed a molecule that hits the same site, although 
uh, as far as I'm aware, they don't have a pet they can And so that's, that gives us the potential now to look at a second measure of synaptic transmission. And this is now looking at excitatory synaptic transmission in the forebrain, which uh, many believe is critically important for cognition. And so it's great to have these two, um, two ligands to work on. So um, just a little bit of clinical data. This is published from, uh, this is Rich Carson's group, who's been doing a lot of this work out of Yale. Um, this was published a couple of years ago in German Neurology, and what they show is that uh, the binding of SV2A down here um, uh, in, in across patients, it's actually within healthy volunteers in the dark circles, uh, MCI patients in orange and, and AD patients in blue, you see a correlation between um, SV2A binding in the hippocampus and epistolic memory scores across these um, individuals. Uh, and you also see a significant correlation with uh, CDR summer boxes, which is a measure of, of dementia. The higher the CDR sum, summer boxes score, the higher the amount of dementia. And again, that, um, that maps across the hippocampus. So that's consistent actually with a couple of things. Obviously it's consistent with um, the earliest um, deficits in Alzheimer's disease being associated with hippocampal and parahippocampal dysfunction, consistent with obviously the um, tau aggregates uh, found early in um, hippocampus, central rhinal cortex, and, and other parahippocampal regions, uh, and consistent with a loss of synapses uh, being crit critical for loss of cognition. And as James mentioned, that's one of the earliest pathological um, associations with, with cognition when you look at um, post-mortem brains. So the second ligand uh, is this TARP gamma-8 uh, amperoceptor selective ligand. So it turns out that on, if, you, if you run a screen of small molecules against TARP gamma 8 associated amperoceptors, and this say, was done at Lilly a number of years ago when I was there, and then it was subsequently done at, at J, around the same time as done at J&J, um, you can find molecules that bind selectively to these gamma 8 associated amperoceptors with very high affinity, like uh, sub nanomolars. So you can like, find picomolar molecules that bind a site. And actually the work done by uh, Mike Maher and colleagues at J&J, &J, which is actually detailed in this paper, um, they identified the, the binding site of, of the molecules um, and really characterized this thing beautifully. There's a little bit of the data here. So just showing the, the distribution in uh, radio ligand binding of, of, uh, of one of these molecules. So this is um, top on the left hand side here and top is C is, um, the in situ for uh, TARP gamma 8. So it's highly expressed, obviously, in mouse hippocampus uh, in parental cell. It's also expressed in uh, neocortical layers as well. And then the rest of the images here are radio ligand binding images of one of these molecules that Jane Jay discovered. And you can see very, very high binding in hippocampus in rats, uh, mice, rats, um, and over here in H is monkey. So again, you can see this very high binding in monkey hippocampus here. And if you look at some of the physiology here, this is just showing top right here, the, um, east, the, 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 the um, dose response or concentration response curve for one of these molecules, 118, uh, in um, recombinant cells expressing GLUA1, gamma8, uh, that's in blue, uh, sorry, in uh, black here, and in blue is the efficacy of these same molecule in blocking uh, synaptic transmission in, in mouse hippocampus. And you see very high, uh, affinity, a uh, very high efficacy and potency, sorry, of, of these molecules. And you get about a 50% block of synaptic transmission for this particular molecule. So they're actually neg negative elasteric modulators. They're not, um, they're not uh, actually uh, competitive antagonists. And then this is shown again in the hippocampus, you get a block in wild type animals. And if you knock out gamma rate, you get no block of synaptic transmission. Um, if you go into humans now, and so um, Hartmuth Colburn colleagues who run the um, biomarker group at J&J, &J, and Hartmuth is a very experienced um, uh, developer of PET ligands uh, with our PET chemists there. Uh, they developed a PET ligand, very, very, very high affinity. It's a uh, peak molar affinity. And as James already shown you this, this image from human brain, uh, you see it's very high binding uh, in hip, human hippocampus with lower level of binding in, um, in cortex. So it's a very useful uh, molecule. And just to say, you know, pet, ligand, uh, pet ligands are, we think, extremely valuable. Um, and it's non-trivial to produce pet ligands. It takes a very serious chemistry effort, which has hampered the discovery of pet ligands, um, particularly in academic groups, which just typically don't have the, uh, the amount of resource to do pet chemistry. Um, um, and 
So I think one of the, the, the areas of value that industry can bring to these sorts of collaborations is we can bring these ligands and, and, and make new ligands as well, potentially to interesting um, target proteins when there's a, a good rationale to take them into humans. Um, and then just to focus a little bit on the pre preclinical experiments, so um, where I'm going to run out of time shortly. Um, so the, 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 the plans here are to look at the relationship between SV2A or TARP gamma 8 amperoceptor um, radio ligand binding, i.e. using the same molecule that's used as the PET ligand in the humans, but using radio ligand binding in tissue sections from uh, mouse models or rats, and also comparing that to levels of expression of the proteins themselves using immunocytochemistry, immune histochemistry in iPSC-derived neurons, and that's going to be done uh, at Cardiff, uh, Nick Allen's group, uh, in synaptic transmission and brain slices, so uh, Kay Cho at uh, King's College, and Kay's obviously one of your DRI colleagues, um, and also Andy Randall's uh, at, um, uh, at Exeter is, is doing a, a work as well, and then also in vivo electrophysiology, um, which also Andy's doing. And just a couple of uh, images here. So this is actually work that was done when I was at Eli Lilly many years ago, uh, showing that in a mouse model of tauopathy, this is a TG4510 mice, which expresses um, mutant tau under the CAM kinase 2 promoter. It's um, inducible. You can see alterations in synaptic transmission, sorry, in synaptic plasticity at four weeks old, uh, sorry, four and a half months old, and alterations in input output curves, i.e., synaptic strength at um, CA3, CA1 synapses at eight months with actually renormalization of synaptic plasticity. And this eight month period is when you start to see very significant neurogeneration. In, in hippocampus, four and a half months, you're actually not seeing neurogeneration yet, but you see alterations in synaptic function. Uh, this is, um, uh, these are silicon probe recordings from Andy Randall's group, which they published already in the TG4510 mice, in awake behaving mice, looking at properties of grid cells in interrhinal cortex, looking at oscillations. This is phase amplitude coupling between theta and gamma oscillations. Uh, and they also, uh, with these probe, with dual shank probes, can get very nice units which they're also measuring. So a really nice way to link back to the circuits underlying cognition that are dysfunctional in humans. And of course, we know that one of the earliest phenotypes of humans with MCI is, is a loss of ability to um, spatially navigate and loss of episodic memory, which are thought to be subserved by very similar systems in the human hippocampus and entrinal cortex. So um, we think this is a really beautiful way to link back to the underlying physiology that um, James and the other clinicians are using uh, which they're measuring using MEG and the and the um, the paradigms, behavioural paradigms in the human patients. Um, so I haven't really had time to show you a lot of the a lot of the data, but I just wanted to give you a flavour of some of the inf of the some of the experiments that are being proposed to be done. And I think it'd be really interesting to, to hear more from DRI colleagues going forwards as to how how you can see the ability to translate the the work you're doing on novel targets, novel biology novel understanding of, of dysfunction of synapses, but also neuromonology mechanisms, vascular dementia mechanisms that you can translate back towards the clinical studies that DRI are doing to make, I think, a really powerful package uh, of data that will really inform the understanding of the disease, when to intervene, what sort of therapeutics to use, what sort of biomarkers to use to run the most effective clinical trials. And I'll stop there, Giovanna, and I apologize for being slightly long. No, thank you very much, John. Uh, I think you provided a very nice um, example of how, you know, basic uh, basic investigations in preclinical models can actually help and uh, feed into also the clinical studies and uh, informing better about disease uh, progression and disease monitoring. So we have one one question from Jennifer Pocock. Uh, glial cells express some receptors. So how will you differentiate signals from neurons versus glia in your PET studies? Well, we won't. Um, I mean, we won't if they uh, express TARP gamma 8. And I'm just trying to think what I know about whether glial cells have TARP gamma 8. And I can't remember. And I may not, it may not be known. So, so these are only TARP gamma 8 associated M receptors. But I, but I should point out, I mean, these are still fairly rough tools. I mean, you, we also know that a significant amount of M receptors are present on the surface of neurons that are not at synapses. Um, and they are associated with gamma rate. So there is a signal that we're going to see that's not synaptic amperoceptors. However, um, there is very, very high enrichment of amperoceptors at synapses. So we believe that majority signal will be. But, but it, it's a great question. I think 
it, it gives you a great example of a, of a relatively simple experiment to go and do is to ask, do glial cells in the forebrain contain tap, tap gamma ray and receptors? And we can simply dump the compound on and see if it, um, if it blocks them or, or not. Uh, just to add to that, in terms of the P2X7 receptors, so oligodendrocytes and astrocytes also express P2X7, but at a lowish level, and it's, it's, the, it's the substantial increase in the microglia when they're activated that we'd be looking for. But it, it's certainly expressed on the surface of other uh, uh, astrocytic glial cells. Okay, great. I don't think there are any other questions at the moment, but uh, I mean, I, I, I think it was... Uh, I think very helpful to for our research. Ah, there is one from Blanca Diaz Castro. Blanca, I knew that you had a question uh, from the Edinburgh UKDRI. Uh, how can collaborations between UKDRI and DPUK be set up in practice? Could you give an example? Uh, let me, let me just start that one, James. Um, yeah. I was going to ask that question to wrap it up, but Blanca obviously preceded. No, 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 that, that, that's excellent. Uh, and I, I, you know, James will follow on from this. Um, uh, our, our ethos really is to be collaborative and to, to follow questions. So where there is a common question uh, and a common interest, then just join the conversation. It's as simple as that. Uh, we, we already have links with uh, DRI investigators. Uh, we very much hope to develop more links. We are focused on those three themes that we've described today, uh, but nevertheless, that's plenty of scope uh, for developing conversation. James? Yeah, just, just to confirm that, it's a dynamic process. We were looking for growth and strengthening of those links. So don't feel you've been left out just because you weren't already listed in the groups. This is something you want to extend. So in practice, there are some projects that are joint projects. So there's polygenic risk source of information and uh, immunogenicity and dementia. That is really, I see it as a, as a joint partnership going forward. Uh, one of the things we'd like to do to facilitate this, to bring new people and new partnerships, is a series of workshops. So, so to have the vascular themes of DRI and DPUK meeting together, the, the new synaptic theme within DRA to meet up with the synaptic theme in a little more detail than we've had a chance to, to take on board today. And the same for the, vas the vascular and the immunology and synaptic. There's a, some very natural partnerships there to, to grow. We've got people in both, but they're probably small numbers of individuals are in both institutions. We'd like that to, to become much richer so that there's you know, a common understanding of the direction we're all pulling in and some useful exchange of ideas. For sure, we will have opportunities to, to bring together yeah. the themes which have also been emerging you know, over the last year or so in the UK. So yeah. we yeah. clearly have these three areas of synergy that uh, are clearly overlapping. So yeah. I think there could be a lot of exchanges, even just scientific discussion and debate, because I think, yeah. as you showed in your slide, much can be um, learned from each other. It's a, it's a bi-directional arrow. I like that uh, yeah. slide very That's much. And I'd, I'd say we're, we'll be very promiscuous with our samples. You know, there's blood and fluidics we can share happily. But I think it's, it's the intellectual engagement we're really after that's even more yeah. important long term. Absolutely. I think uh, yeah. we, are, we are quite complementary in terms of, uh, you know, objectives and, uh, you know, expertise. Uh, Blanca says, thank you. I feel those meetings could be very useful. And Blanca, I mean, she's a, an expert in the neurovascular niche uh, from, you know, the astrocytic and fit uh, uh, and endothelial cell point of view proteomics and uh, molecular mechanisms at, at that level. So, of course, you know, I'm sure, Blanca, you will be involved I'm sure. So um, I think uh, uh, that's it for the moment. And uh, I would like to thank you all. And I think also Vanessa and John who have disappeared for the moment. But uh, thank you very much, John uh, Gallagher, yeah, Sarah, pleasure. James, pleasure. Uh, John Isaac and uh, Vanessa for, uh, for your time and Emilia for uh, obviously being the Zoom master in this case, as always. And uh, I will uh, keep in touch and uh, we'll make sure that uh, we'll continue the conversation soon with more events. Thank you very much. Thank you, Giovanna. Thank you, Giovanna. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Well. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.